go ahead and start. Hi, I'm uh, James Pace. I'm from Runtime. Uh, we're going to be giving an overview uh, myself with Marco Kiskila. Uh, I'm going to provide an overview of uh, Runtime, uh, very brief, and uh, a bit on Apache Minute, an open source operating system for constrained uh, MCU class devices in the Apache Software Foundation and then get to how we're using uh, a protocol called OIC 1.1, uh, exposing it as an application layer, uh, an application framework, and how we use it for management. Uh, so we'll spend a lot of time there. So uh, a bit of background on uh, runtime and Apache Minute. So um, a couple of years uh, back, uh, in late uh, 2014, um, uh, a few of us from a company called Silver Spring Networks set out to build a cloud-based management and monitoring system. So at SilverSpring, um, our backgrounds were having uh, built and uh, deployed and managed over 23 million uh, connected uh, devices, mostly in the utility space, but also in uh, industrial IoT and smart cities. And uh, so we, we built systems on chip, we designed systems on chips, we built out modules, we built all the firmware that, that went on these devices. We drove two transceivers. Um, one was a 2.4 gigahertz transceiver running uh, Zigbee, a protocol stack that we co-designed, and uh, an 802.15.4G frequency hopping spread spectrum uh, implementation, uh, narrow band over 900 megahertz that provided you know, really great coverage for these utility applications. So we put these devices in things like uh, electric meters initially, then they gravitated upstream to uh, medium voltage and low voltage equipment, things like transformers and capacitor bank controllers. And then ultimately, as we were leaving, we were there for uh, nearly 10 years, uh, things like street lights for a canopy for smart city coverage. And so it was something of an unheralded uh, project. Uh, we conceived the protocol standardized in the IEEE. It's called 802.15.4G and then we deployed and managed it. Uh, so, um, and our, our largest footprint was uh, over five and a half million uh, devices connected uh, reliably at Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, about four and a half million at Florida Power and Light. And uh, so we learned a lot about building embedded systems, but we also learned a lot about uh, managing uh, millions of de connected devices that, that needed to be on all the time and, and reliably uh, connectable. Uh, so when we left, uh, we saw this thing called the IoT was uh, happening, and we, we, we realized that we'd been doing that. Uh, and we thought we would apply some of our learnings on, on the management side to constrained devices. And so we started looking at a lot of consumer applications, and what we realized was that uh, the, the state of play, uh, the landscape, hadn't really changed much uh, from the perspective of a developer building a connected product. So at SilverSpring, uh, one of our first decisions was to, to choose an RTOS. We choose, chose one uh, from Micrium called UCOS. We modified that heavily. We chose a TCP IP stack from a small company, modified that heavily. Uh, we had one poor guy maintaining uh, Ike V2 and trying to upstream his changes to the, the family business uh, that never saw the light of day. And, uh, you know, the, the, the story goes on. Uh, we developed our own bootloaders, secured our own bootloaders, did the over-the-air upgrade scheme. Um, when we got out into the non-utility world, we noted that uh, people were basically building their own bespoke OSs in the same way. So one observation was that single chip solutions were becoming more and more powerful, more flash, more RAM, more processing power on uh, Cortex-M class devices, uh, and yet they couldn't run Linux or Android, and yet they deserved kind of all of the functionality that you might see from a general purpose operating system. When you download Linux, you expect to have uh, protocol stacks, you expect to have bootloaders. In the embedded world, you cobble all of that together, and then you maintain your own bespoke OS for the life of the product. And if you've got multiple products, you may have multiple bespoke OSs that you're maintaining. So in order to build a cloud-based uh, management and monitoring service, uh, client libraries and an agent style approach just wasn't cutting it. It didn't go deep enough. So we decided to embark on an open source operating system called Apache Minute. And uh, so the stack diagram there is um, uh, basically represents what we're doing. So uh, we have a real time uh, scheduler, a real time kernel. Uh, we don't really differentiate hugely on that. But what we do have are all the components that you need to assemble a product and maintain it over time. So that includes things like a flash file system. It's Apache 2 licensed. Uh, the ones that we saw out there were um, mostly GPL'd. 
in uh, an aside. In, in embedded products, everything is statically linked, and there can be troubles. Uh, some, some legal groups uh, don't necessarily like uh, the obligation or the perceived obligation of contributing back code to, um, to GPL products. So everything here is Apache 2 licensed. Uh, we include a, uh, uh, a um, TLV, uh, lighter weight TLV storage mechanism with a circular buffering scheme, a secure bootloader that we've broken out of the project and are collaborating across multiple OSs on, uh, rich instrumentation of the microcontroller, the transceiver, and tasks in the OS stitched together by an OIC 1.1 logging infrastructure, and uh, the world's first Bluetooth low energy stack down to the controller level, uh, which has really kind of been our differentiator to date. So um, it's, it's a pretty expansive OS. Um, uh, we're getting a lot of traction, particularly from companies building connected uh, product with Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, because of all the configurable uh, configurability that you have, you, you have the opportunity to set breakpoints, direct access uh, to peripherals. You can set your, um, your connection pools. Um, you can size them correctly. We're doing 32 concurrent connections, which are important in a lot of real-time location service applications. Uh, we can trade off throughput for uh, the number of concurrent connections. You just get a lot of options that you don't typically get when you buy a chip and you inherit a, a, a license binary from a vendor. So, uh, and there'll be more uh, protocol stacks coming soon. Uh, so, we, um, uh, a little side note here, when we say OIC, uh, OIC is, is the acronym for the Open Interconnect Consortium. And what this diagram represents is kind of an evolution of um, the, the, the standards bodies or the specifications bodies that are emitting these, these specs. Uh, back in the day, uh, it didn't seem like too long ago, there was something called All Scene. Uh, it was perceived as competing with uh, Open Interconnect Consortium, OIC. OIC rolled up uh, UPNP. Uh, those two organizations merged and became the Open Connectivity Foundation, the OCF. But on, along, and, and uh, the OCF is a Linux Foundation uh, initiative, uh, has I think 11 or 12 platinum members. It's, it's a pretty substantial organization. But on the side, and, and this, is, this is sort of interesting, uh, there's a separate Linux Foundation project uh, called IOTivity, which is, its purpose is to um, uh, provide reference specifications. Uh, reference implementations, rather, uh, for uh, uh, OIC and the successor spec, which will probably be named OCF. So there's an IOTivity uh, Linux implementation that's been out there for quite a while, but there's also IOTivity Constrained, which is a microcontroller class, very uh, parsimonious uh, implementation uh, that's completely different from the Linux-based one. You had a question? Exactly, yeah. So right now when we're talking about it, and IOTivity constraint is based on OIC 1.1, but the successor specification will uh, use the appropriate acronym uh, provided uh, they don't change the name of the organization again. Uh, so, um, but uh, we're really happy with it. So uh, this is my last slide, and I'm going to hand it over to Marco. Um, why OIC in Apache Minute? So we, had, uh, we were referenced by one of our chip vendor partners, a customer who uh, really liked Apache Minute, uh, the totality of it, but they, they wanted to use OIC 1.1 as an application layer or an application layer framework. And their idea was, wow, we really like the fact that you guys have a controller uh, level implementation of Bluetooth Low Energy. If you could go all the way up to the stack to the application layer, we can develop apps for that. But also, we, by having an, uh, this implementation, that deep, and by virtue of the fact that it's an OS, it provides hardware abstraction, and what they get is leverage across chip vendors. So as we port this to other chips, so we're initially on the Nordic NRF52, we followed that with the NRF51, and then uh, we're also porting to the NXP, uh, the old Freescale KW41Z. So now these companies can uh, actually have optionality and uh, exert uh, pricing leverage against the chip vendors, and I think you're probably going to see some uh, cheaper system-on-chip solutions uh, coming out over the course of the next year or two. So uh, this, this company wanted to do that. Uh, we took a look at it, and, and they're also very frugal, uh, and uh, they're using uh, the uh, older generation of the Nordic Semiconductor chip, uh, the NR51. So the NR52 has a bit more flash, a bit more RAM, uh, a slightly better processor, uh, but the NR51 
uh, has, is, is really uh, constrained, and, and that's what we're talking about here, is, is developing in a constrained environment. Uh, so uh, we started to look at the protocol. Uh, we thought there's actually some really, really admirable aspects to it. Uh, in particular, it uses uh, CoAP, uh, the Constrained Application Protocol. Uh, it's a RESTful protocol uh, that's been specified uh, at, uh, by the IETF. Then there's also CBOR, uh, Concise Binary Object Representation for uh, JSON. And uh, we like that because it has respect for small frame sizes. So a lot of the transports we're talking about going over, Bluetooth Low Energy has incredibly small frame sizes, but also uh, things like Zigbee or Thread, which operates on uh, 802.15.4 radio, has 127 byte frame sizes. So uh, having that built in uh, uh, was, was great. It was goodness. Uh, because most of the application use cases around uh, all scene or open interconnect consortium when these, when these specifications were being defined were um, really for home use cases and, and transports over Wi-Fi, which has like a 1500 byte MTU. So uh, seeing that there, that was, that was great. Um, we started to pare that down, and then uh, we also had a proprietary logging infrastructure. So, you know, runtime, when we initiated this, and you'll, you'll see uh, Apache Minute has a huge focus on this, we care about the upstream-facing uh, interfaces. We care about secure bootloaders and how you do over the uh, air upgrade in a very consistent way. We care about abstracting away instrumentation so that we can manage the system as if it's a, you know, as if it's a beating myself up, as if it's a, uh, you know, a server in a data center, but it could be in a lock or a, uh, a window latch or a wristband. And so we care about uh, managing those resources, and so we defined a, a proprietary logging infrastructure, and then we thought, well, how do we squeeze more uh, out of the space? And actually, this OIC implementation looks quite good for doing uh, logging, and having a standard there is actually quite good as well. So uh, Mark will talk uh, quite a bit about uh, how we plumb that into the system and, and use that as a core of our logging infrastructure. Because these systems, you're not running syslog or SNMP or any kind of traditional IP-based management protocols on, on top of these constrained devices and constrained networks. Um, the other thing that we liked beyond just the uh, efficiency of the um, the protocol itself was as a, a solid security framework. We didn't want to reinvent that and service uh, resource, service and resource discovery. Uh, so some of the use cases that we see beyond home networking or industrial IoT applications, uh, sensors, mapping uh, 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 different sensor APIs into OIC so that an upstream device can simply discover all the functionality of a downstream sensor is great. So when you're, when you're talking about industrial IoT, you typically have these gateway applications. They call them the edge, but there's an edge beyond the edge, and that's these smaller devices. And one of the challenges in really getting industrial IoT out in a um, deterministic manner and at scales, you need to manage all of these devices. The gateway sh shouldn't just be just uh, dumb protocol translators and trying to figure out what these, these things are doing at the other end. The connectivity needs to be reliable and deterministic, and the, and the device itself needs to be manageable. So uh, sensors are a great application, but then there's things like uh, you know every light bulb is, is going to have a Bluetooth chip in it one day, a Bluetooth carrier, and uh, it's probably going to have some sensors in it too. So we think that there's commercial and industrial use cases that'll that'll be really well served by this. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marco, uh, who'll talk about the implementation and uh, really kind of uh, where we're pushing things and some of the things we'd like to see. And I'll give you this. That better? Yeah. All right, good. So um, if you attended uh, Kishan's uh, uh, talk yesterday, uh, so this is going to be a um, uh, duplicate uh, data. So I was going to first talk about OIC a little, uh, what it, uh, what it uh, looks like. Uh, um, um, just high level, basically, you know, uh, what kind of a protocol it is and uh, what, does it, uh, what does it entail. So uh, the goal of OIC is to uh, provide uh, two different uh, places where the APIs is or you know, where they uh, um, <coughs> um, give rules how you should do things. One is how to abstract resources, how to export them uh, to OIC framework. 
and another one is how to map these resources into protocols underneath um, <clears throat> um, protocols uh, like HTTP co-op um, um, or both of these are restful um, so there's server there's client um, 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 then also um, it includes uh, um, rules about resource discovery you should be able to do that uh, with your protocol mapping um, um, uh, rules about uh, what the protocol needs to needs to be able to do that's the um, uh, basically get set um, and uh, then there's also this notify mechanism basically uh, what that means is you can uh, register to be notified if, if a resource changes its value so it not it's not just client asking server what's the current state you know the server can also tell that uh, there was an update to this um, and then uh, the IOTVT reference implementations like uh, James uh, already mentioned um, um, this is that uh, same thing in a form of a picture there's a client there's server these uh, logical operations uh, create retrieve basically get set that notify uh, they go from client to server um, underneath uh, there's the specific protocol OIC runs over and uh, um, there's co-op here you know uh, it could very well uh, be HTTP if needed um, <coughs> so uh, the resources um, what's a what's a resource um, a light bulb uh, could be a resource um, um, you uh, have a uh, there's an example of a resource uh, uh, in that box um, OIC declares that you know you have to have uh, certain fields uh, always present uh, um, in a resource um, you have to be um, and uh, the client should be able to discover what these properties are like uh, this light um, uh, light prop resource uh, is read write you can change its value um, um, does it look like it's uh, something that uh, <clears throat> there would be um, there would be uh, another field saying you know if you can uh, register to be uh, notified uh, um, uh, when it changes um, you, know, you can see uh, it looks like JSON there um, that's uh, that's the that's how uh, OIC uh, publishes its uh, data models as JSON uh, but uh, this is uh, over the air this is encoded as CBOR uh, there's uh, key value pairs um, um, state is on for example key value pair um, um, so resource discovery um, this is uh, this is uh, interesting to um, um, uh, 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 for the client you know especially if you try to write uh, generic clients you don't know exactly what you have on your ne network uh, being able to do this uh, um, eases up the deployment uh, quite a bit um, depending on the uh, underlying protocol you know you have different things co-op um, co-op runs over UDP um, um, so uh, it uh, uses uh, UDP multicast uh, uh, to uh, initiate the query responses come uh, um, uh, back as unicast HTTP um, that uses MDNS um, to uh, uh, publish this uh, publish information about these uh, servers um, with uh, Bluetooth um, um, <coughs> you advertise it uh, um, in the uh, Bluetooth uh, advertisements you, know, you say that you know this UUID is uh, present on this device and uh, that's how the client knows that uh, this is a guy who can talk uh, OIC um, and uh, um, <coughs> after that um, it can go ahead and uh, ask for the resources that the device uh, uh, exports um, like resource discovery with the uh, UDP multicast is um, co-op uh, it's just a co-op request uh, to uh, um, um, asking uh, 
everybody to respond to OIC RDS uh, uh, URI and uh, the response contains a, um, a lot of the data that uh, that uh, uh, device has. Uh, you can also filter um, if you formulate the requests uh, uh, right um, you don't get um, all the OIC clients responding. You can limit um, what type of dispo, uh, devices respond to you. Uh, after you've discovered these guys and you, know, you want to know more, um, you use these uh, two other URIs to get uh, more information about the device. <coughs> and then uh, operations on resources. Uh, um, this is uh, pretty standard uh, RESTful inter uh, uh, interactions. Um, this is the acronym that uh, OIC uh, uh, likes to use. Um, um, the most common use cases would be get, set, and uh, notify. Um, um, the notify, <coughs> indeed, uh, there's uh, certain resources you can uh, you can register uh, um, um, observers for, um, and. Uh, uh, after that, the uh, server can send you uh, data about changes in that resource. Um, and uh, then uh, IoTivity. Um, there are reference implementations, or um, um, if you uh, you can just run with this uh, uh, if you are building uh, if you have a, a bigger system. Um, uh, these are great. Uh, uh, this is a great library because it's multi-platform. Um, um, uh, Unix, um, I think there's iOS there, um, Java uh, for Android. Um, um, and uh, um, you can, uh, so what uh, we used uh, the, I, um, the, uh, the big um, IoTivity uh, library for was uh, uh, to uh, write uh, clients uh, uh, on uh, on our Unix machines, um, but uh, to get it to fit into a small system, you know, you can't. Uh, it's uh, it's way too big. Um, luckily, there's IoTivity constraint, um, which we initially took uh, pretty much uh, ASIS um, and um, uh, ported it over, and you know, it worked okay um, for uh, bigger MCUs. Uh, um, NR52, which has you know gobs of uh, more memory than uh, than these 16k guys, um, but yeah, then uh, we had this request coming in that you know we have to be able to fit it into a smaller device. So um, uh, after that, um, I had to um, take it uh, under heavy modifications. Um, 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 Basically, just to uh, cut down, mostly to cut down the RAM use. Um, uh, our implementation, indeed, is based on that. Um, we do um, um, IPv6, Bluetooth, um, um, low energy, and uh, uh, also um, uh, we run co-op or serial port, you know, if uh, when appropriate. Um, we augmented this code with uh, regression tests. Yes. Uh, to the constraint framework. Um, yes, uh, we did. Um, um, <laughs> th uh, as it happens. Um, so, um, um, what um, the biggest problem we had uh, for running the IoTVT constraint was not so much the text size, um, uh, uh, code size, it was uh, definitely the uh, memory size, uh, memory uh, RAM use. Um, uh, it had, um, 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 it uses memory pools, which is great, you know, uh, we like that, you know, uh, you know, you can, uh, it's much easier to uh, size your memory uh, to match your application you know, you can, uh, if you have a leak, you know, you can uh, more easily uh, uh, figure out there's only limited users for it. There's no fragmentation. All that is good. Um, unfortunately, there were a lot of uh, 
those memory pools. Um, and uh, what the uh, IoTility constraint is, uh, is um, it has, um, it had um, implementations of uh, features that you would normally find inside an OS already. Um, uh, so um, I uh, systematically went um, through the code and uh, um, replaced their use of uh, their own implementation with uh, um, with calls to minutes uh, matching uh, matching code. Um, um, <clears throat> this I did for timers, um, 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 control flow, um, um, and. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, there were quite a few uh, few things uh, uh, other than that. Um, there was also um, <clears throat> uh, biggest uh, code savings uh, had to do with uh, uh, with uh, data buffers themselves. Uh, so uh, what the IoT constraint expects is uh, all the data to be contiguous and uh, you know them being in control of uh, of that uh, memory pool. Um, and these uh, entries are large. You know, it has to hold the full frame. Um, so, um, Minute has its own uh, uh, network buffer scheme, mbuffs, you know, um, uh, which are linked together. Um, um, so, um, I had to go through the code and uh, replace all the calls, uh, all the places where you know. Uh, data was read in uh, instead of just expecting the data to be there replace it with a call that actually can follow a chain of m buffs uh, basically abstracted uh, to use uh, this discontinuous uh, uh, memory buffers um, and once I did that I could uh, I could share this memory with our Bluetooth stack therefore overall uh, um, uh, less memory footprint also zero copy which is nice um, um, and another thing that uh, yielded uh, significant benefits was um, um, the way um, the payload of the request was uh, um, decoded. Um, the implementation in uh, IoTivity constraint, the way it does this is uh, it takes the whole payload and uh, out of that uh, C bar or, you know, which looks like JSON, um, and it creates a tree of objects. And you know, all these entries come from memory pool. The data gets copied to another uh, block of memory, um, basically the values. And you know, um, and this is done automatically uh, before calling uh, the resources uh, get or set handler. So I replaced that with a version uh, that. Um, actually does this decoding on the stack. Um, the um, user provides pointers to where the data should be encoded, uh, uh, should be uh, placed. Um, so um, I could get rid of all that memory. So you know, now if it's temporary data, you don't have to hold on to it at all. If it's data that you care about, you know, you can start it later or just decode it directly where you want to retain it. Um, um, <clears throat> right, and you know, it was not just the uh, uh, IoT constraint that um, uh, we had to modify for these uh, um, M, uh, for our net network buffers. Also, Tiny C bar, uh, which is a library, uh, which is small footprint uh, library for uh, decoding encoding C bar. Um, also, with that. Um, um, we replaced the bottom half of it uh, where um, it um, asks uh, for more data. Um, instead of just expecting a flat buffer, um, you have get set uh, routines uh, for getting, uh, um, getting or setting um, uh, different amounts of data. Um, and you know, that can uh, serve the data to uh, tiny seaboard either you know, from a flat buffer or from this uh, um, um, non contiguous uh, memory buffers. Um, <coughs> yeah. So all of your systems are in your tree, right? So That's right. Is there any plan on your part to push some of these features back to the 
Um, yes, uh, we uh, did uh, talk with uh, Kishan and, um, and um, uh, Diego um, uh, about uh, doing that. Um, some of it, so first of all, when I started doing this, you know, it was just, you know, whether we can fit it, you know, no matter what, you know, we have to make this happen, right? So therefore, you know, upstreaming was not the um, uh, concern then. So um, some of this data is definitely something that can be pushed up, like the tiny seaboard changes. You know, I think that would be valuable overall. You know, because you know, I think everybody, uh, a lot of people do have uh, use uh, use these uh, chain network buffers. Um, uh, that uh, can definitely come up. Also, um, the fact that I moved the abstraction uh, between the OS and the IoTVT constraint. That's also something that uh, can be uh, pushed up to IoTVT constraint. Um, 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 you know. So, yeah, but you know, we'll see what, uh, what uh, maintainers of uh, IoTVT constraint uh, will do uh, about these uh, individual things. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, it is. Uh, it is. Uh, um, it was interesting uh, uh, result. So um, here, I think the uh, salient uh, lines are the ones that talks about the OIC prior to uh, we starting uh, the optimizations and uh, <coughs> after. So. Um, <coughs> 16K of RAM, uh, we have to fit the Bluetooth stack there as in addition to OIC, and you need to leave uh, space for the user application as well. Very important you know, when uh, building these uh, um, frameworks is, you know, you know, you can fit your stuff, but you know, how about the actual, <coughs> actual uh, code that does something there? Um, so anyway, um, so uh, we got good uh, savings on RAM and um, uh, as a result of um, um, relying on OS more, uh, also um, you know the text size uh, went down uh, uh, quite a bit. Um, and you know now there is, uh, I mean, 16k of RAM. There isn't much to start with, but at least there will be some left uh, um, uh, to play with uh, afterwards. Um, all right. <coughs> And uh, what next? Um, so um, we are using um, um, OIC as uh, our management protocol as well. So um, we export uh, anything uh, that you know um, you can uh, either for debugging purposes, uh, development purposes, or for managing uh, uh, devices on the field. You know, it's all. Yeah, OTA, uh, uh, it's done uh, with uh, over OIC. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, we are going to look at um, uh, contributing these data models uh, to um, 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 back to um, OIC. Um, and uh, also um, <coughs> we'll try to help uh, upstream the changes that uh, we have done to the OIC itself uh, because, you know, with these changes, I think you know there's completely new class of devices that you know you can run this stuff over, which uh, and you know um, people like cheap. You know they don't want to pay more for the MCU that they can. Uh, they absolutely have to. Um, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, we try to be good, uh, good, uh, good citizens. Yeah. Right. And Not be obligated to 
the superset of certifications that ITILI does. So I think the things that need to happen is, uh, you know, first bullet, um, there's a, uh, uh, basically the way you do uh, this over BLE GAP, BLE 4.2 implementation, that needs to be codified and standardized. Uh, that, there's been a working group uh, in the OCF for that, but I'm not certain how much progress uh, has been made there. However, I think having a reference implementation of showing an actual application or a set of applications, uh, and particularly managing the devices using OIP intrinsically to an OS, I think that'll help drive that conversation. Uh, so we hope to have that in Amsterdam uh, deal with OCF. And then, um, so we think there'll be a certification. I'm not sure that it directly lines up with what's been done with IoT as a whole. Yep. So other than the, the memory impact, is there still any performance um, impact studies comparing bare metal IOC to running to running the OS? Um, not uh, not so much. Um, the um, the problem with uh, running just bare metal uh, without uh, OS here is um, uh, the um, interactions with the Bluetooth. Uh, so. Um, like you know, in this um, 16K application, uh, you know, I don't. Uh, we don't. Uh, well, all the packages are written such that you know you can call them as libraries. So you know, in theory, you could uh, get rid of the OS altogether. Um, the only exception is uh, the Bluetooth uh, controller code that uh, sort of runs on its own context. You know, it wants to run whenever it wants to run, um, and you know, it's not running in an interrupt. So you know. So, um, so basically, no performance impact studies have been done. That's right. And if you want Bluetooth, you probably need the OS. Uh, yeah. If you don't need the Bluetooth, you can compile a library. Yeah, that's right. If you don't have connectivity options, the use of OIC is probably... Well, Wi-Fi. Yeah, even with Wi-Fi, you know, I mean, you don't need an OS. I mean, you know, it's very flexible in that yeah, regard. Well, in my case, I'm milking all the performance of the piano of a SAMD21. Right. And, and, uh, yeah, we run on SAMD21. Right. But, but I don't want to lose my right. Yeah. 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 Uh, take it for a spin. I think uh, for me, you know, uh, the number of cycles, you know, has not been uh, that big of an issue. It's always about RAM more than you know, uh, you know, how fast you know the response comes back. Uh, so uh, that's why, uh, um, like, um, but you know, you know, you can build the system however you want, right? Um, so uh, what uh, what we have made possible is you know you can either have just uh, two tasks or and you know that's it you know there's the uh, controller and you know then there's everything else and you know you basically have no context switching except to the um, to the um, idle task right so you know or you know if you don't have Bluetooth then you can have just a single task uh, that's uh, that's how I for example run the OIC. Uh, uh, over Wi-Fi on SAMD21. So this is kind of like your earlier Silver Spring stuff, either industrial motor monitors? Yeah. Yeah, love to chat about that. Okay. So, um, kind of the UDP is a land-based protocol. Right. So what do you do for management on the land side? How do you want to OIC? What protocol do you find for the land side? Uh, so uh, at the moment, uh, Oh, the question is, uh, you know, um, OIC uh, discovery co-op uh, over UDP, uh, this multicast, uh, this is a land-based thing. So uh, how do you uh, uh, do this uh, from the WAN side, basically from the cloud? So um, at the moment, the model uh, we have for this is uh, existence of gateways. Um, uh, so therefore, the um, entity who talks OIC to the endpoint uh, would be present in that local land or in a close vicinity. Um, we haven't uh, thought about it uh, too much, you know, how it would look from one side. Okay, so when you're talking about reverse OS management, you're talking about within the land, within the land itself, there's a gateway that's managing these edge devices. That gateway has some other protocols as well. So that's it's right. Not, it's not, it's not OCF. So there's a <coughs> So 
Um, we uh, actually, um, there's a um, um, yes, so, uh, uh, no, so, no, not really. Right. Yeah. Yeah, especially, yeah. Bluetooth, you know, there's no WAN. You know, you are not going to connect to WAN with Bluetooth. So, yeah. therefore, not the immediate call. But, so, the um, current implementation of uh, Bluetooth uh, connection with OIC and IoTVT actually uses TCP-style headers uh, on the co-op. Um, so, you know, that didn't exist in the IoTVT constraint. Uh, um, so, um, I added it because I just want to talk to normal libraries, you know, you know, multi-platform, all that goodness. Um, so interoperability. Sure. So I've never seen notify using Um um I love it. Um you know um in my previous life uh, I was uh, working at the uh, IoT uh, uh, IoT uh, uh, company that uh, uh, was using restful stuff. Um, not OIC based. Notify was uh, definitely used. And you found scale with it? Yeah, it was okay. Um, well, scaling usually was not an issue because the number of uh, um, um, users uh, or clients uh, connecting was not that uh, that that large. Yeah, but in the scale requirement, Yes, then there's an issue. Yeah. Yeah, this was uh, more of a home, yeah. home, home use case. Yeah, I can see cases where that is needed, but it would be functional. I don't think it's going to be truly needed. So, for instance, when you do a firmware upgrade of a large system and you expect to expose you know, some new objects, you would have to have your neighbors expose them. But Yeah, that's true. But you know, if you want to do uh, secure this securely, then you know, I mean, doing security over multicast, you know, especially on a constraint guy, you know, it's uh, yeah, something or another has to give. Uh, sure. So, yeah, the um, uh, you are, uh, I assume you're asking about the uh, updates to the IO3D constraint and uh, how, are, how, how do they trickle in, into this uh, code base? Also, your own fixes going Oh, into the device. So, um, we have an a OTA framework uh, which, uh, which uh, existed uh, before we started doing OIC. Uh, so, um, Secure uh, uh, firmware updates um, um, uh, with uh, with uh, accompanied uh, bootloader. You know, uh, the bootloader is uh, now uh, being used uh, um, elsewhere as well. Um, you know, uh, forked off as its own project. Uh, but uh, um, in addition to that, you know, you need the process of getting the images to the device and you know deciding when to switch over and you know being able to fall back, you know, in case some uh, something uh, something happens when you try to boot it up. Um, you know, <coughs> that um, that stuff is already um, in existence. Uh, uh, what we did was uh, we just took our existing implementation of these uh, these uh, things and you know mapped it over OIC. Um, actually. Before, um, in our uh, previous uh, um, um, uh, revision of this, uh, uh, everything was uh, JSON. Um, 
we have to do JSON because JSON is, uh, you know, it's not, you know, condensed. However, uh, people who write clients, you know, on uh, various platforms, uh, you know, for uh, phones and, you know, laptops, uh, you know, they have very easy libraries available for passing J JSON. Luckily, um, Cbor is uh, more dense, uh, so, you know, it's not as costly uh, over there, and pretty much you get the same um, abilities uh, um, in terms of ease of implementation uh, for the client. Um, um, I think I uh, saw them, uh, started talking about uh, different things. But uh, anyway, uh, upgrades, yeah, um, um, yeah, you can uh, upgrade these binaries. Um, and how would we maintain this source base? Um, um, uh, this is, uh, This is a, a, a part of the Apache Minute uh, um, source tree. Um, so, you know, whenever we need uh, new features, you know, it's going to appear there. Um, and, uh, you know, we uh, intend to follow, hopefully, uh, us and the IoTVT constraint implementations we will converge at uh, some stage and, you know, we can actually just play with the same code base. Um, uh, until that time, you know, uh, we'll, uh, we'll hold on to this one. Because you know it works uh, works for us. Um, so we, we do OTA. Uh, we drive that with DOIC wrappings, but uh, management works with some monitoring. So we have uh, mappings to how to uh, object objects that are defined to uh, abstract away a microcontroller. So we're predominantly for tech dims. Uh, we do have a MIPS port, not a PIC32 port yet, but that's in progress. We've got four to five versus five ports. Uh, so the abstraction there is good, and you know I say it's useful. And that's whether that's you know, doing logging um, upstream to a management device or, or locally uh, on, on the system. The same holds for transceivers and tasks in ELS. Uh, we have signed up, so we're also members of the Zephyr project, uh, and we signed up to do the logging infrastructure to maintain that. We hope to leverage that across multiple projects. Stepping back. As an aside, for us, it's important to have all of these common upstream management interfaces, irrespective of what the OS is. Uh, we don't think there's going to be any singular OS that has 100% of the market tomorrow. Uh, it won't be Zephyr. It won't be Apache Minute. There's others like um, uh, Riot and Skokia. There's Kotiki. There's FreeRTOS. If those other um, OS initiatives or RTOS initiatives start to adopt these components, it's easier for you guys and product developers right management systems. And so that's been important to us. So we want to see OIC based on infrastructure adopted you know, across all of these initiatives. Uh, in terms of the customer, um, it's a pretty simple use case. It's a consumer-ish use case where they basically just want to discover objects uh, on a consumer device using uh, a handset. And so they have a framework already that they have on iOS and Android devices, and that's what drove them to uh, adopt OIC in three points. Uh, I mentioned before, I think there's a lot of industrial applications and sensor applications that will be lost by this. Right. So, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I want to thank the IoTVT constraint guys. You know, it was uh, great to uh, start with a reference uh, as opposed to writing everything from scratch. You know, it was great that, uh, you know, protocols came with, uh, with, uh, with uh, this kind of code.